So the topic of the boy crisis, I think, is probably the most under-the-radar topic there is today, except when there's a mass shooting. And so what we need to do to make sure that this does not continue is what we're going to learn tonight. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Warren Farrell, co-author of The Boy Crisis, the only man ever elected three times to the board of the National Organization for Women in New York City. He was chosen by the Financial Times of London as one of the world's top 100 thought leaders. His first bestseller was Why Men Are the Way They Are, and his just-released book is The Boy Crisis, co-authored with John Gray. Now, Warren is an academic, which you'll hear as he tells you about his research, and only an academic could have a one-hour conversation at a party with John Lennon and have no idea who he was. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dr. Warren Farrell. Royce Mann was 14. He produced a video that went viral because it expressed in words what so many boys feel. I'd like to share a portion of that with you. Recently, I became a man. It happened the first time a woman avoided me on the sidewalk. She glanced back and changed direction, crossing the street. Her footsteps taught me the danger of my own hands. In that moment, I finally understood Peter Pan. I want to stay a boy, not become a man, because a man, as I now know, is a mix between a father, brother, and attacker, mostly the latter. Feel Royce's shame, the danger of my own hands, at his male identity being mostly an attacker at his conclusion, I want to stay a boy. In no part of Royce's entire poem did he discuss the positive aspects of masculinity. For example, the sacrifices fathers learned as part of their male role to die in war so their families wouldn't have to live under Nazi rule, or to mine coal so their children wouldn't have to mine coal. It is a rare junior high school teacher today that teaches your son that millions of moms made sacrifices of careers and millions of dads made sacrifices in careers. Often earning money that someone else spent while his dad died sooner. In school, he doesn't seem to learn anymore that both parents made sacrifices so their children would have a better life than they have. Instead, the most common word boys today associate with masculinity is the word toxic. And the emotion that emanates from toxic is, of course, shame. Everyday life reinforces this for boys like Royce. It is, after all, boys and men who are doing the mass shootings at almost once a week. Hashtag me, uh, hashtag me too makes a mask. If there's no man I can trust, can I trust myself? For boys like Royce, hashtag me too is the latest iteration of a half century of holding up our binoculars to the female experience of, of powerlessness to the female experience of powerlessness and the female experience of male power. No one has suggested that we also hold up our binoculars to the male experience of powerlessness and the male experience of female power. Hmm, I noticed a little something in the audience. He's saying, what is the male experience of female power? You may have heard it, as a son, your son may have said sometime to you, Kristen is so beautiful, she would never go out with me. I'm not even on the football team. But your son would never put it this way. 
mom and dad, this is an example of my experience of my powerlessness and, my, and, the female, and the male experience of female power. You see, I feel I have to buy her drinks and dinner just to make myself worthy of her. Royce's video went viral because the cultural zeitgeist is that boys' opinions are not valid because boys have male privilege that they are part of the patriarchy that has made rules to benefit men at the expense of women. Now it is women's turn to speak up, men's turn to shut up. Any expression of his feelings is called mansplaining. Ask your male Uber driver if he believes that he's working 65 hours per week because he has male privilege or male power. He intuitively understands that the road to high pay is a toll road and that his role to earn more to support his family is an expectation. You're the dad, you pay those tolls. But he would never say, the expectation I feel to earn more is a type of gender discrimination against me. Now, what else is happening to our boys? See if you can pick up the hint in the following sentence. Tests by the Program for International Student Assessment find boys falling behind girls in almost every academic area in more than 60 of the largest developed nations. I tried to say developed nations slowly so you'd pick up the hint. Uh, de developed nations have in common two things that both affect the boy crisis. First, societal permission for divorce. And second, freedom for women to have children without being married. In the US today, 53% of mothers under 30 who have children are, do so without being married. Now here's the key. The big divide is between the welfare of boys in these two groups who have minimal or no father involvement, what I call dad-deprived boys, versus the welfare of boys whose fathers remain significantly involved, what I call dad-enriched boys. There are more than 70 ways I've found in the research for the boy crisis that boys who are depri dad-deprived are in fact deprived. In contrast, boys who are dad-enriched do better in school even when they come from four poorer areas with lower ranked schools. They have less ADHD and more empathy. Yes, actually dad involvement leads to an increase in empathy. Dad deprivation, on the other hand, is the greatest predictor of a boy committing suicide or taking drugs. Dad-deprived boys are much more likely to drink excessively, be bullies, to drop out of school, to be alienated, to be rudderless. The result, our prisons are, centered, are centers for dad-deprived boys. These boys are hurting. When boys who hurt, hurt themselves, as in suicide, we respond with a cultural shrug. But now the boys who hurt are hurting us, we're taking note. Dad deprivation is common to 26 out of 27 of the mass shooters who have killed eight or more people. Ironically, the availability of an AR-15, uh, AR-15, you see how familiar I am with guns, um, with AR-15 style assault weapons is making us more, care more about boys because they make it easier for boys who hurt to hurt us. Dad deprivation doesn't just hurt via mass shootings. ISIS recruits are almost all dad deprived, not only the boys, but the girls. But involving dads is a lot more complex than people think. For starters, it involves understanding exactly why dad-style parenting helps children.
Take roughhousing, for example. Although many mothers just see a dad who is roughhousing as one more child she has to sort of mother, <laughs> few dads know that roughhousing helps children distinguish between being assertive versus aggressive, or that roughhousing creates a father-child bond, and it's that bond that reduces the child's resentment when the dad enforces boundaries saying, for example, OK, no more roughhousing until you finish your homework. What's the importance of this boundary enforcement versus boundary setting? Both moms and dads set boundaries. You can't have your ice cream, let's say, until you finish your peas. And kids, and kids test boundaries with both parents. But when the child tries to persuade mom to have the ice cream before she or he finishes the peas, mom is much more likely to think, I'm not going to waste these few precious moments with my child arguing about a few peas. Dad is more likely to think, and sometimes not even say, but just with his eyes say, you know the deal, finish the peas, then the ice cream, or don't finish the peas, no ice cream. Dads enforce boundaries, re requiring the boy to finish the peas before he gets the ice cream, helps his son develop the single most important prerequisite to success, which is postponed gratification. A boy without this discipline often slides down a slippery slope, as do many girls without this discipline. The boy can't finish his homework without the discipline of not being able to be distracted by a text or some other interference. He fails, therefore he fails in school. He receives less respect from friends and teachers. He begins to feel ashamed of himself, becoming depressed, escaping at the end of a needle, or by addiction to video games or porn. In worst case scenarios, he commits suicide, or angry at never being seen at school, shoots the people to whom he was invisible, killing for their attention. Boundary enforcement is just one of many propensities of dad-style parenting that lead to children benefiting far more from dad time than dad's money. One of, the la one of the best ways of integrating dad into the family is via family dinner nights. However, done poorly, family dinner nights can become a family dinner nightmare. <laughs> I found it necessary to develop guidelines for effective family dinner nights. The most important guideline is no electronics at the table during family dinner nights. If you cannot enforce that rule, go back to boundary enforcement. If the children are running the parents, get ready for the family dinner nightmare. What can single moms do? The ideal is to let dad know that you need his distinct parenting style as a check and balance with your own. Men, the key word is need. Men die in war to be needed, to be seen as a warrior. When we tell dads they are needed, father warriors will appear. Now, if you're divorced, there are four must-dos that, must that I've found. If your children, but especially your son, are to have the best possible chance of doing well, as, they would, as well as they would in an intact family, the four must-dos are one, an equal amount of time with mom and dad. Number two, parents living within about 20 minutes of each other. Number three, no bad-mouthing. Number four, consistent couples counseling. If, if involving the biological dad is absolutely impossible, here are seven options. Get your son involved in Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, the Y, Boys Club, the Mankind Project, a faith-based community that facilitates all boys support groups, or a young men's ultimate weekend here in San Rafael with Mark Schillinger, who's here with a lot of the boys um, from his group. As for a stepdad, if you're a stepdad or you have a stepdad in your life, the most important thing to know about stepfathering is a stepdad is only as good as the biological mom allows him to be. Stepdads and bio moms need to study 
how stepdads can be integrated into the family, it never comes naturally. What can schools do? Four starter steps. Actively recruit male teachers for preschool through junior high. A boy going, we now know that a boy going from a female dominated family to a female dominated school is vulnerable to seeking identity from a male gang leader or an ISIS recruiter, as was true with Hitler Youth. Second, reactivate recess. The latest studies show that recess does more to improve grades and the ability to focus than studying. Third, vocational training. In Japan, 99.6% of vocational training graduates are immediately employed. Four, institute organized sports within each school that includes every student and celebrate the, the achievement of these less well-known boys. What is the most pivotal solution on a national level? A White House Council on Boys and Men that addresses the 10 major causes of the boy crisis, integrating consciousness of the boy crisis into our cultural and in the process, saving into our culture and in the process, saving literally, and I calculated it, trillions of dollars on crime, the op opioid crisis, prisons, and our homeland security response to radical terrorist groups that are the result of the boy crisis. To conclude, when we support our sons, we support our daughters. Women in the workplace relieve the pressure on men to be the sole breadwinner. Dads at home can relieve the pressure on women to be the sole parent. Moms and dads need to know their children benefit far more from dad time than dad's money. We're all in the same family boat. When only one sex wins, both sexes lose. Thank you.